this street behind me is bent and it's actually done so for a good reason. It's not a mistake, but actually a design feature. Good morning and I'd like to get you excited about Silver Zones. These formerly white 50 km per hour streets have been transformed in areas with high percentage of elderly residents in the name of safety. Here are some features you may find in the Silver Zone. Perceptual traffic calming measures are optical illusions that narrow a lane. Slow markings warn drivers about upcoming physical traffic calming measures. White paint can also be used to optically narrow a lane, like this on both sides of a road, or this, or in the middle of a roundabout. White triangles, not to be confused with shark's teeth, are another example. These triangles, typically used on bands approaching pedestrian crossings, create a funneling visual effect. Painting around a typical white marking creates an optical illusion of floating lane markings when travelling along a road. These are called 3D lane markings. Perceptual traffic calming measures are the easiest to implement, as all that's needed is paint. But paint is just paint. Flexi bollards are flexible and don't do much damage to a vehicle. The effect of traffic calming through optical illusions will decrease once a person is used to this road. Like this driver, who's clearly travelling above the 40km per hour speed limit. At roundabouts, people simply drive over the paint, treating it like how the street was before it became a silver zone. Physical traffic calming measures are much more effective, as failing to obey them may cause much more damage to a vehicle. Speed regulating strips at the start of every silver zone are an example, though they can't be felt much in a car. Lateral deflections like chicanes with curbs on both sides force people to slow down. A lane can be narrowed using a center divider, some of which feature shorter medians to allow emergency vehicles to pass over them. These are called mountable center dividers. Roundabouts also stand in the place of former stop lines and junctions, which not only reduces the number of conflict points between motorized traffic, but also better regulate traffic flow with the removal of stop lines. At informal crossings, the lane is physically narrowed. This lane is just 3 meters wide, compared to its previous width of 3.8 meters. The space created through lane narrowing creates a pinch point for drivers and provides a refuge for people walking, with its safety further enhanced by the presence of bollards. Priority is still given to motorized traffic and the crossing features black brick surfacing instead of usual asphalt. Vertical physical traffic calming measures are the most effective and include humps for cars and where bus routes ply a gentler bus-friendly hump is used instead. These are usually placed right before a pedestrian crossing, and combining that with pinch points creates an excellent raised zebra crossing. A refuge in the middle allows people to look out for traffic one direction at a time, and its raised design makes it more comfortable for people on wheels. Pedestrian safety is reinforced with the presence of bollards, which have the capability to demolish any vehicle upon impact. In certain places, the entire junction is raised up. When approaching a junction like this, the road is first raised to grab a driver's attention of upcoming areas of conflict. The driver has to first look out for pedestrians who have started to cross the street, after which, look out for other vehicles. This process is reversed when exiting the raised junction. All that's left is priority, also known as zebra crossings for pedestrians, and it will be perfect. Some silver zones have an even lower speed limit of 30 km per hour, on par with urban streets in other developed cities. This silver zone in Jurong West serves both seniors living nearby and students at a nearby primary school. A lower speed limit allows pedestrians to cross side streets without detours something which I'll talk more about later. Enough examples for now, so here's a clip of yours truly piloting a hunk of metal to demonstrate what it's like to drive through a silver zone. 
Oh by the way, slip lanes are dangerous and shouldn't exist in built up areas. As I approach the entrance of a silver zone, there are speed regulating strips and a speed limit sign of 40 km per hour. Following that, two lanes merge into one narrow lane to form a pinch point. This treatment is also done for other crossings. This road, which was formerly a wide and smooth curve, has been converted into a roundabout. This is good. It just needs walking and cycling crossings. After the roundabout, we are back on the street's original design. It's pretty silly for a street to constantly widen and narrow between one and two lanes. One lane per direction will do fine, allowing footpaths to be widened and dedicated cycling paths to be built instead of narrow shared paths. If a bus stops at a bus stop, just let the cars queue behind. After all, this is a local street, not a major thoroughfare. Turning left, this side street has a huge turning radius which is strange because there aren't any regular bus routes that have such a turn. This wide radius forces pedestrians to detour and sadly doesn't give them priority. Black brakes intended to raise driver awareness cannot be felt when driving over. This isn't good. What comes up next however is an optically narrowed lane, followed by physical narrowing, and a raised zebra crossing. This is so much better. A substantial number of people are crossing the street here, but sadly there aren't facilities that legitimize such patterns. Ugh, I hate slip lanes. They are very dangerous and I don't understand the rationale of constructing one in a traffic calm zone. The space for this slip lane should have been used to create raised pedestrian crossings instead. One more turn through a roundabout that lacks pedestrian crossings, a hump, and we are out of the silver zone, back on the typical 50km per hour car centric roads. So how does the silver zone improve safety? Reduced speed limits and physical traffic calming measures to enforce it allows people driving to have a wider field of vision. Multiply the numbers in this graphic by 1.6 to get approximate figures in kilometers per hour. This allows people to have more time to react to whatever may happen, reducing both reaction distance and braking distance. Going 10 km per hour below 50 doesn't sound much, but in the event of a crash, slower vehicle speeds decrease the risk of pedestrian death by 60%, and at 30 km per hour, this risk drops by approximately 90%. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that crash rates in such streets have been reduced by 75%, from 14 to 4 cases per year on average. Silver zones aren't just about slowing cars down, they are ultimately meant to help people outside of car move around more easily. Raised zebra crossings and signalized mid-block crossings can be sheltered to protect people from inclement weather. And these are typically connected to a network of sheltered walkways. Signalized pedestrian crossings are okay, but if they take too long to turn green for pedestrians, people will start making their own decisions. If there's something silver zones need much improvement in, it's walkability. A street is meant to be a place with complexity, and complexity is what forces people to pay attention. Here are two shophouse lined streets. Which would you feel more comfortable driving through at high speed? This one with pedestrian fences, right? Oversimplification by forcing people to cross at certain places despite its good intentions reduces the traffic calming effect of complex streets and allows people to let their guard down when driving. This may be a contributing factor in how a 2016 Silver Zone study found that most motorists involve in distractions while driving, even at slow speeds. Pedestrian fences not only increase walking distances, they also reduce visibility of the crossings that pedestrians are redirected to. A new feature that I found in newer silver zones is this pedestrian calming device. Actually, it's formerly known as the Danish offset. But they are used incorrectly in terms of design and context. The main purpose of such a crossing is to force pedestrians to face and look out for oncoming traffic. Reversing that defeats its purpose.
and unnecessary conflicts are created when insufficient space is given to people walking and cycling to negotiate. Furthermore, road design manuals recommend such a treatment only in areas with low to medium pedestrian volumes on roads with speed limits higher than 50 km per hour. That's the exact opposite of a silver zone, where pedestrian volumes are high and vehicle speeds are low. Unlike raised zebra crossings that have bollards to demolish a car upon impact, Danish offsets here only have pedestrian fences which collapse upon the slightest impact with a car. The person in the middle will be the one demolished instead. Crossing setbacks are promoted as a good feature by their ability to reduce crossing distances. However, instead of narrowing turning radiuses to slow cars down and building a continuous sidewalk to achieve that result, pedestrian fences were erected instead. While this theoretically redirects people to a narrower segment of a side street which still gives cars priority, senior citizens do not have as much energy as I do when it comes to walking longer distances. It's disrespectful that people are forced to walk convoluted routes in their neighbourhood, just so a person driving can turn into a car park more quickly. People deserve much more direct crossings in their own neighbourhoods. Imagine how much nicer it would be if silver zones are levelled everywhere, with bollards stopping drivers from encroaching pedestrian territory. This street-wide barrier-free design makes it accessible for all, and makes high-speed driving feel unsafe. Removing pedestrian fencing increases driver visibility and allowing the street's complexity to flourish forces the driver to pay attention. People can cross the street wherever they please, helping to reduce walking distances throughout the entire zone. Now the street no longer functions like a sewer that segregates residents, but instead connects them. This is what I hope existing zones will look like in the future. While silver zones are not the best street design out there yet, they are a smash, and mostly a step forward in the right direction towards greater road safety. A 2022 study about residents' perceptions of silver zones by Samuel Cheng found that while people have differing views on how road safety can be achieved, everyone has a common desire for greater road safety in their neighbourhoods. With its popularity, 50 more silver zones will be coming up by 2025, and with Singapore's ageing population, it's expected that a greater demand of such traffic calming measures will come real soon. And when that time comes, I hope that we won't have silver zones anymore. Because despite the connotation of just helping a certain group, in this case seniors, their safety benefits extend to everyone else too. How nice it would be if these zones aren't slapped with a label, but in the future, simply known as the way we build our neighbourhood streets. Hey, thanks for staying to the end of this video. If you'd like to see more videos about street transformations, stick around as I'll be documenting more silver zone upgrades. And if you really love what I do, I have a Patreon page linked in the description. As always, thanks for watching, and have a good morning.